I'm going to be talking to Evelina Stoiku about battery prices in different regions of the world. We all know that China produces uh, the, most of the world's batteries, but North America and Europe have been trying to catch up, but they haven't been able to catch China yet. So welcome to the interview, Evelina. Thank you for having me. That's uh, it is true. It's one of the main trends when it comes to battery prices. Um, in China, we observe much lower prices compared to other regions such as North America and Europe. Um, and specifically, battery pack prices in North America and Europe were 44 and 56 percent higher compared to China in 2025. Now, um, the prices that we're tracking include both domestically produced batteries as well as imports from China in these regions. Um, and there are multiple reasons why this is the case. Um, when it comes to imports, there in many cases, there's a premium associated to importing batteries from China. Um, there are additional costs such as um, logistics and then transport. Um, and also the fact that um, uh, companies might be, might be charging different prices in different regions. Um, when we talk about domestically produced batteries in North America and Europe, um, the cost of producing them is also co considerably higher compared to China um, due to higher input costs in these regions. So, for example, there are higher labor costs, electricity costs, land is more expensive. And this is broadly true for, for many other industries as well. Like making things in these regions is, is, is more expensive. Um, but they are catching up. And as scale in these regions comes, we expect to, to see lower prices um, there as well. What's your take on how long it will take for North America and Europe battery manufacturers uh, to catch China in terms of scale? Probably not scale because the Chinese scale is so vast, so huge. Uh, but how close might they uh, get to price parity with the Chinese, or maybe you know the disc the the difference is maybe five, ten, twenty percent, and they can live with that as opposed to you know forty five, fifty five percent. Yeah, I think in the near term we're still going to be seeing a difference. Um, it's going to be very hard to change these fundamental factors if we just look purely at economics and all the inputs that go into manufacturing. Um, however, as you said, uh, um, they are going to be a lot of these companies are working towards uh, costs and price targets, um, and there's probably an optimal uh, percentage differential for for each company. Um, and the other thing that can help here is policy. So in the U.S., um, there's the production tax credit, which uh, um, can be quite important for companies making batteries in in the U.S. And these types of policies, whether it is directly supporting um, the producers or incentivizing demand and um, um, compensating sort of the customers through through tax credits, um, these are things and, and tools that can help bridge the gap between uh, uh, China and other regions. Let's talk about policy for a moment, because U.S. President Donald Trump, uh, who's been in power now for just about a year, has, has basically gutted all of the Biden administration programs uh, that were, uh, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act and others that were designed to build a North American battery industry and supply chains to compete with China. Uh, what role will the changed policy framework for in, in uh, the United States affect the development of the North American battery industry? Yeah, when it comes to the changes that we saw in 2025, um, some of the incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act were removed, such as the EV tax credit. However, the production tax credit, um, or 45X, for, for battery cells and packs is still available. The big change is that there are more restrictions around um, which companies are able to access it, um, and a lot of details are still pending. Um, so on, on that front, um, we, we think companies are going to be able to, to benefit from that. Where, where it's going to become more tricky is uh, the procurement of the materials that go into the batteries, uh, because a lot of these changes um, want to uh, incentivize sourcing from North America and free trade agreement countries. Um, so companies are going to have to rethink around where they're sourcing a lot of the input materials. And because the upstream battery value chain, so the raw materials such as uh, the metals, 
um, and uh, precursors and cathode and anode materials, because a lot of that production is in China. Um, we expect companies to um, look for alternative sources outside of China, which could incentivize investment in additional regions um, from, from companies. Um, let's talk about Europe for a moment, because I've been seeing uh, headlines all uh, la all of last year about the death of the European battery industry, uh, the problems with North Volt, for uh, example. Um, what's your take on the ability of the European uh, battery industry to become competitive? Yeah, we've seen some moves from Europe as well. Um, policies such as the Battery Booster uh, Program to allocate funding, whether that is through grants or through loans and other incentives. Um, uh, the funding is is not at the same level as the funding that we see in the US, but we do see some incentives and some progress there with more to come in 2026. So policy in Europe is something that we're looking at um, in, in 2026. For sure. Um, it, it's true that a lot of companies have, have struggled and scaling up battery manufacturing is challenging. Um, that's why uh, having expertise and know-how from, from players is important. Um, in the US and in the US, we've seen um, a, a lot of collaboration between uh, especially Korean and Japanese uh, battery maker companies with automakers. So um, in, in Europe, we expect to to, to also see sort of more collaboration um, and the policy supporting it through uh, the measures that are going to be uh, finalized and uh, outlined in more detail in, in the coming year. Yeah, let's talk about Korea, uh, South Korea and Japan for a moment. Um, they've had battery industries for a long time. How competitive are they compared to the Chinese? They're also quite competitive, and um, a lot of these companies have historically focused on nickel-based chemistries, which have been the technology of choice um, for a lot of the EV companies in US and Europe due to the higher energy density and consequently higher ranges. Um, however, we've seen them adopting to, um, to different conditions. A lot of them are moving into LF beef production, especially for stationary storage. So um, a lot of these companies are uh, quite competitive um, and securing sort of plants and, and, and deals with companies in both North America and, and Europe. What, now, outside of the players that we've talked about, uh, are there any other countries that are emerging as players in the global battery industry? And I'm thinking specifically here of Indonesia, which is a very large uh, nickel man, uh, producer and was hoping to use that uh, uh, the amount of nickel it produces as sort of a leverage to develop a battery industry. And then we've seen, uh, you know, EV industry emerge in uh, in uh, Vietnam, for instance. So are there any of the other smaller markets that are uh, developing uh, uh, a battery industry? Oh, and I should mention India would be a, an obvious uh, example. Well, what's your take on that? Yes, all of these regions are definitely worth watching, and they've in the past couple of years they ramped up um, a lot of their plans. They've made announcements um, to bolster their battery industry. Um, uh, I think we we should probably consider them as still relatively emerging markets. Uh, they're not going to be as big as as China, um, and China is really um, much larger in in scale. Um, so it's going to be tough to reach those levels. Um, but uh, we've also seen a lot of Chinese companies um, setting up um, partnerships in those regions and um, building and, and, and thinking about battery manufacturing plans overseas. Um, so um, I think an, a question is going to be whether these are going to be local players that emerge or it's going to be foreign players, for example, companies in China moving into those regions to diversify their, their strategies. I, I think that was a big emerging story from 2025 is the extent to which China has pivoted its uh, electrotech, its renewable energy uh, manufacturing uh, to export markets in the in the global south, particularly in other Asian countries, but also in Latin America, also in in Africa. Um, it, it seems to me that it's not only uh, just the, the companies, 
But also there's a fair amount of support from the Chinese government in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, to build infrastructure, that sort of thing. So it does, uh, does it look like in your, uh, if you gaze into your crystal ball and look ahead the next, say, three to five years, um, what role will Chinese battery manufacturers moving out into those export markets, building plants or building, uh, you know, demand for their exports, how important is that going to be it's going to be quite important to look at because it's sort of the next stage of uh, a lot of these big companies setting up uh, plants in, in, in different overseas markets. Um, so it's going to be quite interesting to see how it plays out. Even in, even in countries such as Europe, a lot of Chinese players have moved there with plans to set up facilities and open them. Um, so um, it's it's definitely something to, to look out for. And... Um, policy is going to be an, another important factor. So depending on the incentives that China provides to the different local companies, um, I think that's going to be another um, factor influencing decisions uh, there. Evelina, uh, thank you very much for your insights. Really appreciate it. Thank you.